Here we go, no, here we go. This time, 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 What's up, everybody? I am your host, Chris Hampton. Welcome to episode 64 of the Power Company podcast brought to you by PowerCompanyClimbing.com. I am here in Lander, Wyoming, uh, working on the new house and just trying to wrap the year up. We've got a few more events. Uh, it's been a crazy last couple of months, and we're, we're stoked for the direction that things are going. Thanks to you guys, as always, for all of your support. Um, if you happen to be in the Bozeman area, Bozeman, Montana, um, or anywhere that you can get there and want to come and see us, uh, we'll be there next week. That's November 14th through the 18th at Spire Climbing Center. Uh, I've been to Spire once uh, to climb with my friend Becky Switzer, and it's a really cool gym, uh, a really cool community there, and we're stoked to come out and meet everybody. So hope to see you there. Um, shortly after we'll be at Knoxville, uh, on-site rock gym in Knoxville, uh, December 3rd through December 7th. Uh, so reach out to them. We've, all, we've also got a strong community in Knoxville. Um, I don't know what it is, but these, you know, we've been building this, this community and it's really taken root in some places and Bozeman and Knoxville are definitely two of those places. So really stoked to come out and see the folks at Onsite again. We've been there before and we're looking forward to it. So December 3rd through December 7th, come and see us. Uh, right after we finish up at Onsite in Knoxville, we're headed to Chattanooga to do our very first event at Crux Conditioning, which is our guy Paul Corsaro's new gym. And we're doing something special there, uh, a new addition to our applied body tension workshop. We're adding kettlebells in for some really effective uh, drills that you can use to learn to create body tension and then apply them to the wall. And uh, we'll all be there, uh, myself, Nate, Blake, and Paul. And uh, we look forward to hanging out with you guys in Chattanooga. So come and see us. That's December 9th at Crux Conditioning. Uh, this summer in July, I, I attended a workshop on fixed versus growth mindset and on you know, the, the principles behind learning and how to learn. And the guy who gave the workshop uh, is our guest today, Trevor Reagan. He's the founder of a group called Train Ugly, which you can find at trainugly.com. And I, I highly recommend you go there and look through their videos, look through their blog posts. Uh, he does really great work. Um, Train Ugly is a group that studies and shares the science of learning and performance. And Trevor's worked with USA Volleyball, several professional and college sports teams, as well as you know elementary school teams. Uh, he works with a whole a wide range of people, including big companies like Chipotle and Microsoft. And when I attended the workshop, I was really kind of blown away by how relatable the message was to just a, a huge cross-section of people. I mean, there were elementary school kids there who were participating and teachers and coaches and high-level athletes as well. And, and I really think that this is a message we should all be reflecting on um, and learning from, you know, particularly if you're a, a coach, a partner, a teacher, um, a parent, um, the, the different mindsets and the feedback that you can give to change a person's mindset is pretty huge. So let's get into this. Adopting a growth mindset is a skill. Approaching situations as a learner is a skill. So the more that you do that, the stronger that muscle gets. Putting people in situations where they get to fight those battles, that's how you acquire that skill. When I first got, you know, turned on to this workshop that was happening and I saw that it was 
a group called Train Ugly. My initial thought was, why that name? You yeah. know, and it took me a minute of thinking about it to go, oh, yeah, that makes total sense, and I love it. Right. You know, but for for the people out there who aren't familiar with Train Ugly. Mm-hmm. Um, which is going to be a lot of my listeners. You know, my listeners are all climbers totally, and totally. we're all stuck in our own little world. Um, but I think just the name conveys a really important message. So mm. let's talk about that a little bit. So two reasons it's the name. One, that was the domain that was available. <laughs> so like <laughs> nice. sometimes you're limited there. <laughs> yeah, totally. um, But I was happy that that particular one was available because I guess the intent of the website is to bridge the gap between what science says about learning and how we can apply that in education and sports and life. And so we see ourselves as the bridge of go learn from the scientists, explain it in a way that people can understand it and use it. And after about a year of studying learning, the biggest principle that's come out of that is the importance of like desirable difficulties in practice and learning. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is our brain is wired to learn better and faster when it's challenged. And again, they call this desirable difficulty, right? Like we can make challenges that are way too hard and you won't learn, but small manipulations to studying and practice actually lead to better learning. And the one pattern that all of those manipulations have in common is it usually makes the practice harder. You will struggle a bit more. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's where ugly comes from. So it's like, look, that ugly that you experience during study and practice actually leads to better learning. So rather than resisting mistakes and struggle, we kind of lean into that because we see their value now. Right. And the ego gets involved so much when that starts to happen, right? A hundred percent. And that's like the trajectory of the website. When we launched it, the main focus was what are the adjustments you have to make in practice to lead to better learning? And then we were exposed to this mindset stuff about how you can maybe change your perception and adjust your mindset when it comes to learning. And what we realized is that matters a lot. So I spent two and a half years strictly talking about the mindset stuff. Right. So we sort of changed courses of, of like, well, like, of, there's so much science about how you can adjust your practice and that makes you fail more. But if you're not mentally equipped to fail more, right. you're not going to reap those benefits. And so I see like this mindset approach as the core. And now that that's the core, that's sort of our helmet that helps us survive in this type of practice. And so moving forward, we're going to start to build more content around here are the adjustments you can make when you study or learn anything that will lead to better learning now that we're equipped with a good mindset. Right. I like that analogy of that's your helmet. (laughs) Um, Let me ask you this and then let's get into the mindset Mm -hmm. and and talk about what all that means. In the course of learning, whether it's you, whether it's USA Volleyball that you're working with or whomever, do you – are there moments where you have to remind yourself, this is the mindset I need to be in and I'm straying toward this side? Yes, all the time. Okay. I well, don't want people to get the idea that you just click into this mindset and it's done and it's there and you never have to think about it again. No, absolutely not. And uh, Tom Black, who former assistant coach for USA Volleyball, head coach of University of Georgia now, he talks about this quite a bit and he said kind of the most fun part of this is the fact that you're not going to be perfect with it. It's literally not even a day-to-day battle, but like an hour-to-hour battle. Sure. And the the empowering part is to be aware of your choices and, and understand like, look, this isn't something you're going to be perfect with, but this is something that you have a lot of control over, mm-hmm. which is why we spend a lot of time putting names on things and creating language. So like jungle tiger, zoo tiger, uh, lizard brain, stuff like that. And what we found is when you create language around it, that's maybe not scientific terms, it's a good trigger and reminder of like, oh, like I just made a zoo tiger choice right there. Right. Versus like, oh, I'm really playing it safe or avoiding this challenge or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so a good reminder is creating language and words around 
these topics. Um, and But again, like I, I try to stress this in all of our workshops. This isn't something that, like you said, just clicks and it's like, okay, I'm good now. I have this mindset and now I can apply that all the time. It's like right. I'm aware of this mindset and understand its power and I'm going to work to stay there as much as I possibly can. Right. Knowing that, of course, this, this is a spectrum and sometimes I will move back and forth. Yep. And do you think it's important for people to be forced into that switching your mindset repeatedly? Um, and what I mean is, you know, the reps that they go through for saying, okay, I'm, I need to be in this growth mindset. I need mm -hmm. to look at, you know, the, the importance of the struggle right now rather than let my ego take over and do those reps doing it more and more and more is that an important part of the process i totally think so because a big part of our message is that you learn by doing stuff so we believe that pretty much everything is a skill if you think about it so adopting a growth mindset is a skill uh approaching situations as a learner is a skill so the more that you do that the stronger that muscle gets. And so putting people in situations where they get to fight those battles, sometimes they'll win and sometimes they don't, that's how you acquire that skill. So we can talk all day in an air-conditioned room and read all these books, and those can give us inspiration and nudges, but to acquire and adapt and, and develop those skills, we have to be out in the trenches right. and be faced with decisions and opportunities where we can choose to uh, lean into an obstacle or shy away. And then the more that we do that, the more aware that we are of those choices and the more situations we're in to make those choices, the stronger that muscle gets. Cool. Now let's talk about the two main mindsets that, that sort of build the, you know, the foundation of what you guys work on. And I know that you take a lot of inspiration from the work of Carol Dweck. Yep. And I just recently read her book, Mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen it. I had heard about it. I hadn't picked up the book and read it. And actually, when we were watching, Annalisa and I watched LT's house while they were gone. Yeah. And I found the book on her bookshelf and, and <laughs> stole it and read it. Nice. And, and it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, it's really, really powerful. So let's talk about those two mindsets. I think that those mindsets and Carol Dweck's work is the like core of all of this. If our goal is to get better at learning in any arena that we operate in, deploying a growth mindset there is essential, I think. And if you had to whittle it down to just like what those two mindsets are, it's a growth mindset is the belief that you can learn and change and adapt. Mm -hmm. A fixed mindset is the belief that you're set, stuck, I can't really learn and adapt and acquire new skills. So people in a fixed mindset, they tend to believe that skills are something you're born with, you either have them or you don't, and you're not really in control of those things. You can't really build on those things. Uh, whereas people in a growth mindset believe skills are built and you can grow and adapt. So there's a, a few layers to that. People in a fixed mindset, some of those people believe that they're stuck. Like, okay, I can't get better. But right. others believe like, look, I'm born with these skills. I don't, right. I don't need to work at them. I'm a natural. Right. And so those, that's two sides of the fixed mindset coin. And what the research shows is when we enter that type of mindset, um, our ability to learn and grow and adapt is really kind of stunted. Because... If you're in a situation and deep down you don't think you can learn, right. you're probably not going to. And the other side is true. If you're in a situation and deep down you do believe you can learn something, you're far more likely to learn it. And sure. that's really the essence of the two mindsets. The fascinating part for me is to look at how those mindsets impact your actions and behaviors and how those actions and behaviors influence your capacity to grow. Um, and I, I think that the big takeaway is the mindsets are super self-fulfilling mm -hmm. where if I don't believe I'm going to learn something or I don't believe that I can learn something, 
that belief usually robs me of experiences that could help me learn the thing. And so I think the easiest one to wrap your head around is if my belief is I'm not a people person, usually if that's my mindset, I'm going to avoid situations where I interact with people. Right. And by mm-hmm. avoiding the reps and experiences, it becomes self-fulfilling. I'm not good with people because I've never interacted with people. Yep. But it's all stemming from the initial mindset. Um, and I just think you can apply that example everywhere. I'm not a math person. Well, I never work at math or never get much out of the lessons because I believe that I can't learn this. And then it becomes self-fulfilling. I'm not very good at math because my initial belief robbed me of reps. Right. You guys at Train Ugly have this great acronym that that sort of flies in the face of convention and that you know, most acronyms want to be short and easy to remember. And, <laughs> but yours is actually easier for me to remember because it's so unique. And it's the self-fulfilling cycle of how to get good at stuff. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, and, I, and that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, and to put that in terms that my listeners can understand even easier, being climbers, you know, we're all sort of pigeonholed into a style at some point in our climbing Mm -hmm. you know either i'm a powerful climber or i'm a technical face climber or whatever it Mm -hmm. might be and what that does that you're saying is for instance me i'm i am not a super powerful climber Mm -hmm. i mean that was not how i displayed my climbing initially so i took that i'm not a powerful climber and i thought well, I don't need to be. All I need right. to do is be a really good technical climber, mm-hmm. have tons of endurance, and I don't need to work on my power because yep. I'm not a powerful climber anyway. Right. So then that comes right back around to I'm not a powerful climber. Right. And it's because I've never tried to work on my powerful climbing right. because I don't need to. I'm a technical climber. 100%. You and know? you can apply that to pretty much every sport. So yeah. in golf, oh, I'm I'm – a long ball player, like I can crush drives, but right. I don't have a short game. Right. So if you think about how those type of people practice, they most of the time we practice our strengths. Yep. We enhance our strengths. And so I'll spend hours and hours and hours on the driving range hitting my driver <clears throat> and maybe squeeze three or five more yards out of that and get a little bit better. But if I spent that amount of time on the putting green and chipping, like that's my weakness and maybe that practice is harder and will involve more failure but that's going to lead to a step change for me as a golfer and the same would be true with climbing i don't know much about climbing but i would imagine enhancing our strengths isn't as effective of adding a new element to our skill set right we get this small percentage of growth right instead of this larger percentage right and we're not saying that everyone has to have like expert level at all of these right, different traits. Right. Like, of course, you're going to have some that you just tend to be better at, and that's cool. But we can also realize that our weaknesses, we have room to grow there, and we can grow there. Maybe they're not going to reach the level of these other skills right. because it's taken a lot of time to develop those, but we have room to grow, and we have the capacity to grow there mm-hmm. where most of us just limit ourselves by never even doing that where we just cut ourselves off from even trying. Uh, I am not this type of person and therefore I never even try it. Versus maybe that's not my strength, but let me spend some time there and 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 grow that a bit. And that's kind of what we're, we're pushing. Yeah, and we've sort of alluded to it a little bit, but you've got a great phrase that I had never really been put into such a concise phrase and that's that the story can rob you of reps. Yeah. And I had never really thought of it exactly that way. Um, But that's what we're talking about, right? Absolutely. It's, we call them, we're still working on the best name. So stories, limiting beliefs, maybe even a better term. Mm -hmm. And those are simply our perceptions of the things that we can and can't do. We get stories from ourselves, but also from others. And so these can be super destructive when it comes to the learning. These are fixed mindset stories of, uh, I am not a math person. I'm not good with people. 
I can't putt. I'm not a good ball handler. And those stories limit our actions. And I like the term robbing us of reps because mm -hmm. if you think about it, I again, I believe that most things are skills. Skills are built from reps. And so when you talk about it that way, I think it um, kind of flips the narrative. And so it's like, if you see, if we go back to the, I'm not a people person. Now, if I look at conversations as reps, like that kind of changes how I approach it. Like, oh, right. this is an opportunity for me to interact with someone. This is a rep. This mm -hmm. is how I get good at it. I'm in the gym right now. Um, and that's how that skill is developed. Yeah. And there's something that I think is really dangerous that that we don't often sort of unpack and look at is that even positive stories, a seemingly positive story can rob you of those reps. Yes. You know, for instance, when I was, I came back to rock climbing after a layoff and decided to really work on my endurance because that was one of my weakest points at that time. And after a year of working on my endurance, everybody was saying, oh, you're an endurance monster. You're so good at this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is your jam. Mm -hmm. And and I started to believe that narrative. Right. And I thought, I just need more endurance, more endurance, yeah, more yeah, endurance, yeah. more endurance. And this is, you know, it's a it's a positive story to me. It's, it's people saying, wow, you are so good at this, mm -hmm. you know. But that just led me to work on it even more. Absolutely. And, and think that's all I need. Right. And so that is a slippery slope because now the ego is in play. Yeah. And so now we've moved past the mindset stuff, but it's this understanding the ego and understanding how those positive stories can get in the way of learning really matters as well. So now this isn't always the case, but something that can happen when we hear too much praise around a skill that level of success becomes too precious and we go to protecting that and maintaining that status yeah and so same thing happened to me back in the day when i played basketball in high school like i was praised a lot for being a great shooter and so what happens is my ego is taught that oh people value me when i shoot well right and if i ever do have an off game like it's crushing of like oh my goodness like people think i'm a bad shooter now like right so we call it if your ego gets attached to the outcomes that's a slippery slope and it's not going to lead to the most development so if i attach my ego to becoming a great shooter what i found and if i look back at my high school experience many times i would not I would rob myself of, of opportunities to grow because my ego was so afraid to look bad. So maybe if I had lifted weights in the morning and was a bit sore, I wouldn't play at night because I knew I wouldn't shoot well. Right. And I didn't want people to see me not shoot well. Right. And like, that's a small example, but that's, again, that's my ego getting in the way where success becomes so precious and maintaining that level becomes so precious that sometimes I'll play it safe or avoid situations where I might struggle. And that's my ego robbing me of learning opportunities. Yeah. And I think you have to stay on top of that for, I mean, forever, essentially. Um, and, and I just recently had a situation myself where I started to see the that old ego, that old praise mm -hmm. coming back into play. And it surprised me a little bit how quick I was to listen to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, I was a I was an endurance machine back then. And then I finally wised up, started working mostly on strength and power mm -hmm. and 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 even things out. And then just recently coming back here to Lander, went to Sinks Canyon where a lot of the climbing is endurance-based climbing, and it felt hard. Mm -hmm. And I had been focused on strength and power for the last year. And then I'm immediately like, but I'm supposed to be this great endurance climber. <laughs> yeah. I can't try this in front of people. Right. You know, I can't get up there and mm. fail on these big holds where I should be able to hang on. Mm -hmm. And the old me, even though I wasn't as strong, would have had no problem with this. Right. You know, and this is years after that you're an endurance machine praise. And after I thought I had gotten mm -hmm. over that, mm -hmm. you know, so I think you have to keep a constant watch on. Yeah 
how much your ego is playing into all this feedback that you're hearing from everyone else totally, and yourself. Totally with you. And that's kind of a tightrope that we need to walk when it comes to learning where it's it's okay to care about outcomes. It's okay yeah. to want to be good and win games yep. and get good grades. And so we say it's good to take those outcomes seriously. It's good to want them. But as soon as we're taking them personally, that's not going to lead to the most development. Like right. if if we're if our results and outcomes are personal where we believe that those are a reflection of us, that's ego, man. And when the ego is involved at that level, we're going to tend to rob ourselves of uh, moments out of our comfort zone where we're going to be less likely to try new things or struggle in front of people. And so that's tough. It's okay to care about those things. It's okay to want to be good. But if that is attached to our ego, it's it's really, really tough. Yeah. And you guys call it thinking like a scientist, yeah, right? Yeah. And I think that's a really powerful way to look at it. Um. And ex explain what that means to me a little I bit. I like that phrase. And we found that, again, naming stuff is powerful. Yeah. So I just bumbled around like 13 different phrases, but you can sum summarize it with this think or learn like a scientist. And so if you think about how scientists approach their work, first thing we can say is they have outcomes that they care about and matter. Right. Like they're trying to cure cancer or do whatever. There is a vision. There is a goal that they're striving for. Yep. Scientists know that outcomes are a reflection of their process. So if they're going to achieve this outcome, it's about constantly improving their process through mm -hmm. experimenting, failing, getting feedback, breaking it, fixing it. Like that's how you improve your process. The more you improve your process, the closer you get to your outcome. Right. So understanding that you see how they are one step removed from that. So let's see, let's say they're trying to, we use Elon Musk as an example with SpaceX. Yep. They're trying to make reusable rockets. They've tried to do this for years. So they launch a rocket up, they try to land it back on earth, it explodes. Okay, that's the outcome now, it exploded. A scientist, remember, believes that outcomes are a reflection of the process, not a reflection of them. So when SpaceX crashes a rocket, there is, of course, some pain and frustration there, but no one takes it personally. They take it seriously, but yep. not personally. Yep. It's not. That's we, a good distinction. Big difference. Yeah. We are not failures. The process was a failure. And that is a huge difference. Yep. Oftentimes, most of us don't operate like scientists, and we believe outcomes are a reflection of us. That's the ego we're talking about. Totally. So the rocket crashes. I am a failure. I am stupid. We can't change this versus something was wrong in the process. Let's go back to work and figure out what that was and launch another rocket. Yep. So the distinction is scientists know that outcomes are a reflection of the process. Whether the outcome is positive or negative, that's feedback on our process. And there's lots of opportunities to learn there. Most of us feel like we're the experiment where the outcome is a reflection of me. Right. And there is a huge difference there. Yeah, totally. I mean, when when a climber is on a route or a boulder problem, there's a massive amount of process happening right. in that you have to choose which holds to use, which movements to make, how close to keep your hips to the wall, you know, whether to use momentum or not use momentum for every single movement you're making on this route. And that could be hundreds of moves, or it could be as simple as five really difficult moves that have a lot of little pieces to each movement. And it's so easy to fall off and just go, God, I suck. Yeah. You know, I can't do this. I don't know what's wrong with me, you know, instead of immediately going to where in the process mm -hmm. did I, f did the mistake happen, you know, and what can I do in that process to make it get closer to success? Love it. And, and that kind of got my brain going. And so I think if we were to summarize this, learning like a scientist is understanding that regardless of what the outcome is there are thousands if not hundreds of learning opportunities in that 
Right. So scientists realize no matter what happens, there are opportunities to grow. Yeah. And a scientist will choose to look for those and find those and appreciate those where most of us miss those because we fell off the wall and our ego hurts and we're mad. Yep. It's okay to feel that pain. It's okay to be frustrated. All of that happens. That's human. But a scientist goes, okay, that's frustrating. Maybe I'm embarrassed, but why did I fall off? Was it an error in my technique? Was it just a fluke? Like sometimes you miss a shot, sometimes you fall. But a scientist will look at that where most of us miss those opportunities because we're so obsessed on and dwelling on the fact that I fell or missed the shot. Right, we take it personally. So this is kind of explaining the important philosophy of stoicism in in a way of understanding that I have very little control over external things and I have lots of control over my perception and attitude towards things. So regardless of what happens to me, I can find opportunity in that. Doesn't mean I'm blind to the the pain or blind to the frustration or blind to the problems. It's understanding that regardless of what happens, there are opportunities to grow. And I think that attitude towards learning or life is actually yeah. pretty important to develop. Again, that's a skill. Yeah, totally. Um, we're not always perfect with that. But if you really think about all the things that happen to us, in sports and training and school and life, everything is full of opportunities. And if we, if we have trained that muscle to look for those and appreciate those, we're going to grow more and yeah. I think be happier as well. Yeah, I, I totally completely agree. And there's a, there's a part of what you're talking about that I think a, when a lot of people talk about it, it's skipped over or missed or, or maybe it's just that we don't, focus on it because it's so nebulous and hard to connect with and that's that you you should still care about the outcomes yeah you know i hear a lot of talk about forget forget the outcome forget the end goal focus on the process and that's Mm -hmm. really easy to say right but if i step up to a boulder problem i really want to do and say i don't care about getting to the top it's probably not going to happen you know because I'm so, I'm, that's what I'm focused on all right. of a sudden. I'm thinking about, yeah. I don't care about the top. Right. And in, in, in doing that, the top is what I'm thinking about. I'm so with you, man. So it, it's really hard to connect with that idea. Yeah. So caring about the outcome is really important. Are there, are there things that you've worked with or, or helped people do, whether it's Chipotle mm-hmm. or or USA Volleyball Mm -hmm. to focus on the process while still caring about the outcome. I couldn't agree with you more. Like that is the distinction that I really want Train Ugly to be about because there's lots of people out there that teach this mindset stuff and talk about it. And some of those people say, uh, surrender the outcome, don't have goals and all of this. And it's like, I'm I'm not there because I think like, those things are a part of life. And so like, I can't go in and work with a major league baseball team and be like, Hey, it doesn't matter. Like, don't think about that outcome. Let's just like invest in the process. I don't think that's the approach. I think we should have goals. I think those goals and outcomes and results can fuel us and drive us. Right. We just need to understand how to maneuver through learning with those. So, and that's the reason we're in the process to begin with because we care about that goal. You know, you, you mentioned in your, presentation the other day uh an an airplane windshield company yeah. right? and i think that's a really <laughs> really clear way to see it right so ppg aerospace like i did a, a day-long workshop with them and so i can't go in and say hey outcomes don't matter let's just focus on the process because they literally can't make mistakes right they cannot they but make they the windshields s- for every airplane <laughs> right like yeah. in the u.s right and so it's like they have to reach a certain level and just like sports teams like they need to win games and students strive to get good grades and good test scores so it's we like to call it like walking the tightrope and i think two things help us with this one is the and this is a seth godin of it's okay to take outcomes seriously but not personally yeah and if you really like chew on that there's a big difference there so we want to take those seriously. 
wins and losses. We want to get to the top, have those goals. I think it's easy to just not have goals. And a lot of people like to say, oh, I'm just not going to have goals. I'm just here to learn. You know, I think you can do both. And I, yeah. I just think it's, it's harder and there's some more tension involved when you do have a goal and strive for it. But like, I think that's good. I really do. I really oh, think I, that's I good. I agree completely. Um, like if we're talking about the good old days, like back in the day in high school, like I had a goal to play basketball for Duke and I was obsessed with that. And that goal drove me to practice a lot. And I got really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to Duke and was one step away from making that team and fell short. And that hurt really, really bad. Yeah. But that approach made me a better basketball player than if I didn't have that goal and was just, right. hey, I'm going to see how good I can get at basketball. Yep. So it was more painful for sure to like fall short of that, but it drove me and fueled me more than, oh, I'm just going to get good at this. Yeah. And so again, it's tough. I think if we're going to have a big goal like that, it's good to pursue it and then just understand what it means that if I do fall short, it doesn't mean I'm a failure because I, I learned so much from that journey and that process. Um, so I'm not defined by my outcomes, but I think we should have big goals and chase them. Like, I think it's scary to do that. Yeah. But I think that will lead to more learning and more development than if we're just cut those outcomes out and just say, I'm, I'm here to learning and get better. Yeah, I think so. You know, in your travels and in your work with these teams, are there things you've seen coaches employ or that you employ to get athletes in particular when they start to take it personally? Mm -hmm. How do we get them back to take it seriously? Yeah. But not personally. Yeah, I think the the best groups at applying it kind of are just open and own all of this where like great coaches can say like, look, like I found myself like taking this personally right. and they share that. Um, I think the, the big takeaway here is understanding if we go back to everything is an opportunity and getting in that mindset when we compete is huge of mm -hmm. like, and, and this is what USA volleyball does really, really well. And so if they televise some of their games and in volleyball, they just like film timeouts. The commentators don't really speak. They film timeouts. And so you could probably find some of these on YouTube, but if you watch USA volleyball's timeouts, they're incredible examples of this. Okay. So it'll be like super tight game. We're really struggling. It's a battle. And then their timeouts, Karch Karai, their coach is going, yes, like this is what we want. Like right. we want it to be this hard we're here. because this is going to make us better in the long run than if we were blowing this team out. So what they do is they want those reps and they want those experiences because their long-term goal is we want to win a gold medal. And we know that in order to win that gold medal, we have to really grow and develop and we grow and develop best when it's hard. Right. And so when it's hard, they don't back down. You can actually see them light up and love it. And so they've reframed and flipped the narrative about what it means. We want it to be hard. Right. Maybe we want some bad calls. We want those challenges because that's where we grow and develop the most. And so they've right. changed the meaning of that. And so if you watch their language and how they approach it, it's when it's a tight game, it's like, yes, this is what we want. Yeah. Versus like, we're not playing really well right now. We should be blowing this team out and all these outcome centric mm -hmm. kind of points that most coaches make. Yeah. So, so it's still a practice, yeah. you know, getting, getting into that right mindset more consistently is about practicing that mindset. Absolutely. And if I, I guess another example is I try to apply this a lot. So my job is to travel around and speak. Right. And what I found um, maybe about a year and a half, two years ago is I would be very, I was taking outcomes personally. So before I talk, it would be, my mindset would be, I hope they like it. I hope it goes well. Um, I hope something connects and all these outcome centric things. Right. But I would take those personally. 
I think it's good to want it to go well. <laughs> like, sure, yeah, like it's yeah. good to take that seriously. Exactly. Like I can't just roll in and be like, I'm just going to do it. I don't care. Yep. Like, so I care about the outcome, but I would get my mind more on the opportunity. And so if I would go into a talk and focus on and appreciate the opportunities, I found I gave better talks. So now before I talk, it's, wow, I'm so lucky to get to do this. Wow. I think this is important information. And even if one person like connects with one topic, it was worth it. Um, and big picture is I treat it as a learning opportunity. This is just another at bat. So yep. every workshop, every talk is an opportunity for me to get better. So if I treat it as an opportunity, I'm going to grow more and get better over time versus, oh my goodness, I hope this goes well. Right. And, and you just said something really important there that, that you're you're changing your mindset going into it. Yeah. That you you approach it with this intention of this is going to be an opportunity. Yeah. I'm going to learn something no matter what. And I care about the outcome, right. but I'm going to choose to focus on that. Instead. Right. So if I'm stepping up to a boulder problem that's really difficult for me, it's I want to do this thing. But regardless of what happens up there, I'm going to learn something. Absolutely. If, if I do really well, nearly perfectly, I'm standing on top of the boulder, I still want to be able to look back and say I learned something. Yep. If I fall off in an unexpected spot, that's even more an opportunity to learn yep. something. Why did I fall off in this unexpected spot? Mm -hmm. What happened? Where did my process mm -hmm. go wrong? I love it. And, and that's what I work to do. And I've found that that has helped me so much. So, I mean, there's been times where like t one person or two people show up to a talk and old Trevor would have like really taken that personally. Right. And I've been there. But if you, again, treat that as an opportunity, you grow so much more there. Yep. Um, and, and I really think that's the case. And like I've had lots of at-bats of applying that mindset in different situations. I've done workshops inside prisons and going in the first time there, like I was really nervous and like, okay, how is this going to connect? Right. And then again, you have to catch yourself because right. Like it's what we said at the start, you're not perfect with this, but to catch yourself and be like, wait, this is an opportunity. Like yeah. let's, let's, let's treat it as an opportunity. Let's get the most out of it. And go do this thing. And yeah. regardless of what happens, this is helping develop this important skill. Yeah, totally. Now there's a really important part of this, this mindset battle that we go through <laughs> and, and it involves the feedback that we get, that we give to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about a little, how we can be better, partners, mm -hmm. better coaches, and and better to ourselves with our feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, Carol Dweck does quite a bit of research mm -hmm. on how feedback can change our mindset. Sure. And it's pretty shocking to me how quickly we can switch sides. Yeah. How quickly just a few words can make us flip into a different mindset right whether that's positive or negative i'm with you okay so if we were to simplify this down i think this this will help people get on the same page and then we'll talk about what they what they look at so the ideal mindset when can we, i stop you for just yeah, a second yeah i'm gonna take a quick break because my cat is freaking this bird out and i'm <laughs> gonna get the cat out of here break. what's up everybody chris here pardon the interruption i'll keep this short and sweet since this podcast started taking off and we've been growing it, you guys have been asking how you can help out. I've got three ways for you. Number one, you can become a patron. That just means you give a monthly donation to the podcast, a dollar and up, and you get something in return. And you can check out what those rewards are at patreon.com slash powercompanypodcast. Best of all, we'll keep it sponsor and commercial free for you. Number two, you can rate us and review us on iTunes. I know it's a pain in the ass to go to iTunes and do all that, but it really helps us out. At least that's what I'm told by the podcast powers that be. And number three, perhaps the easiest way and the best way to help us out is to share us on your social medias. Anytime you see us post up a new podcast, please share it with your friends. Tag people who will really appreciate it or who need to hear the advice that we're giving. 
All right. Thank you, guys. And back to the show. Right. Cool. So, sorry about that. Mama Bird was <laughs> going a little crazy over my cat here. It so, happens. So, we were talking about, you know, this, this feedback that we get that Carol Dweck has researched. Okay. So, if we had to summarize everything we've talked about, we can start with... Uh, if we're thinking about maybe the ideal mental approach to learning and development would be two layers. One would be this growth mindset. So right. deep down, we need to believe we can learn a thing, believe that skills are built. Yep. Step one is that. The opposite of that would be the fixed mindset of, I don't believe I can learn that. Right. That's layer one. Layer two would be focus. Can we focus on opportunities? That's going to be the healthiest and best approach to learning. The opposite of that would be obsessing over outcomes, right. where we only care about the outcome and the result. When we do that, we tend to play it safe or avoid situations where we might struggle. Right. So the ideal approach to learning would be both, that I have a growth mindset and I focus on opportunities to grow no matter what situation I'm in. Mm-hmm. The other end of the spectrum would be I have a fixed mindset and focus on just the outcome. Sure. So if you think about that, those are four sort of boxes that you can be in. Ideal is we have both a growth mindset and this focus on opportunities. Right. Now, sometimes you could have a growth mindset, but obsess over the outcome. Right. Sometimes you could have a fixed mindset and not really care about how you look. So right. it's important to understand you could maybe make like a matrix around that. Yeah. So the ideal is to have both. If you start to look at feedback and praise and how people communicate with one another, you see that oftentimes the stuff we say or hear can shift either our mindset or our focus. So hearing that you're a natural can shift your mindset to believing like, oh, I, I'm good at this. Like I'm set, I'm fixed. I don't have to work at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, Just like it did with my 100%. endurance training. Like you're so good at this. Right. I don't need so to do So hearing feedback can shift our mindset, right. but it can also shift our focus if you think about it. So Anything that we hear that could lead to a story of believing that my skills are set or fixed is destructive. So hearing that, hey, you're just not a math person, like you're just not cut out to be a leader or you can never get into this school. Those are all fixed mindset stories. And that's common feedback that we hear a lot of. You're just not artsy. You're not creative. You're not cut out for this. So all those are fixed mindset stories types of communication and feedback Mm -hmm. but so is you're a natural you're You're so great at this right you're so uh, you're gifted and all of this so all of that we could probably give a hundred more examples of those are fixed mindset beliefs that uh those are all examples of feedback that can create fixed mindset beliefs right right and we and we feel like you know as a climbing partner we might feel like we're giving great feedback yeah. by saying, wow, you're so good at that. Yeah. And so Dweck's research shows that when we give feedback that talks too much about abilities, it usually can shift that person into a fixed mindset. Right. So in studies they've done with students, they found like simply telling a student after they take a test, you are so smart absolutely changes the way uh, they approach challenging situations. So uh, just to summarize the quick study, they gave students an easy test. Half the students were given feedback directed at at abilities. They said, you are so smart. The other group was given feedback directed more at effort or the process. They said, you must be a hard worker. You really worked hard at that. And so (laughs) then they take them through like three more rounds of the study. The first one was they gave all the students a choice of, would you rather take uh, a harder test next or the same easy one you just did? Right. What they found is all the students that heard, wow, you are so smart, not all of them, but 70% of them chose to take the easier test. Right. Why? Because by telling them that they are so smart, big picture what we're saying is we value you when you perform well we value you when you look good i want to look smart again right and so the easiest way to look smart again is to take the easy test so this is showing 
this is moving kind of down the ladder to the focus stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So if like my main focus is the outcome and to look good, yep. the easiest way to look good is to play it safe. Yep. And Stay that's right where I'm at. And so I like this study because we gave feedback directed at their ability. You are so smart. But that feedback influences their focus. Right. So now those students are focused on, I need to maintain this. It's kind of a the example you gave at the start. Right. I need to maintain this. I have to be the endurance climber and show everybody that. Right. And the best way to do that is to not work on my weaknesses. Right. And the students experience the same thing. So this feedback actually was directed at their skill set, but had an influence on their focus. Right. Where the other group that was given feedback on being hard workers, when they were presented with the choice, would you like a hard test or the easy one again? 90 two percent of them said i'll take the hard one right because they were less concerned with i need to maintain this level and more concerned with i want to display that i'm a hard worker mm -hmm. and so that's an interesting part of the study to me the most interesting step was what they did next what they did next is gave all of the students a hard test right what they found is when the students that were given feedback directed at abilities were faced with this hard challenge. Most of them became super frustrated and gave up early. Yep. Why do you think that happened? They didn't look good. They knew Be they couldn't. Right. Because yeah. they were given feedback that said, we value you when you look good. Right. And now they're in a situation where they're not looking good. They want out. Yeah. Whereas... Almost all of the students that were given feedback directed at effort, when they were presented with this hard challenge, they enjoyed it and they worked harder and longer. Right. Because they were less concerned with looking perfect and more concerned with putting in effort. Yeah. And so if you think about that, if we zoom way out, we see that when we enter this mindset and when we really have this learner focus, we see challenges as opportunities because that's exactly what they are. That's a scientist sees a challenge as an opportunity. Whereas if we slip to this outcome focus, we see challenges as threats. This might make me look bad. Yep. Now it's the same exact situation and we totally have control and we get to choose what our perception is. Is this an opportunity or is this a threat? Dweck's work shows that simple feedback can influence that focus and change the way we look at challenging situations. Yeah. So, you know, to put it in terms that my, that my climbing obsessed listeners can really understand, you know, if I'm, if I'm coaching and I am watching someone on a boulder problem and they fall off at that unexpected spot mm -hmm. that I talked about earlier where maybe they shouldn't be falling off or we believe they shouldn't be mm -hmm. falling off. Instead of saying, oh man, that, that moves hard. You're just not, yeah, you know, that moves really hard for you. You're going like, to have to. Are you kidding me? Like, why did you fall there yeah. or whatever? Instead of all that, how should I be responding? Gotcha. So let's summarize it. Let's say, Destructive or sort of pointless, useless feedback only talks about abilities or outcomes. So it's, you are good, you are bad, that was good, that was bad. Mm -hmm. Helpful feedback can acknowledge those outcomes, but tends to focus more on the process. Right. So the, the, the best... So don't forget about the outcome. Right. So I, I, my rule of giving good feedback is... Acknowledge the outcome, focus on the process. Right. Where again, some people ignore the outcome. So someone falls or has a bad game and they hear, oh, you were great. Yep. No, we can acknowledge the outcome. We can say, man, that was a tough fall. And then to focus on the process, we start to look at why did we fall there? What can we learn from that? Was it a fluke? Was it an error in tactics or technique? And how do we fix that error? Right. Acknowledge the outcome, focus on the process. Man, that was a tough game tonight. I noticed you were really rushing your shots. Like, how can we fix that this week? That's the best type of feedback. Yeah. And in studying different groups around the country, the people that give that type of feedback create a great learning environment where 
Our default, on the other hand, is mostly just to stop at outcomes and abilities. Ah, oh, that sucked. Yep. Or you're not very good at that. Or you're really good at that. Right. And when we give that type of feedback, if you really look at the research, it doesn't create a very safe place to learn. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad you just brought up the positive example again of you're really good at that. Because I think we tend to, when there is a success, we tend to just move right past it mm -hmm. and say, on to the next one. Right. You know, and I do think it's important to acknowledge the outcome. Hey, great job. That was awesome. Yeah. What did we do that, that yes. made it work? Because you know, we what take, can we look at? Now? We take outcomes seriously. Good. Right. We made it to the top. Let's celebrate the win. Yeah. Where sometimes if we don't care about the outcome, it's like we made it to the top. Okay, what's next? Let's go. Like, let's learn. It's okay to feel that and be excited and celebrate the win. Just like it's okay to feel pain when we lose. That's fine. Mm -hmm. As long as we shift our focus to the process of, okay, what can we learn from this? So the cliche is that you see all over like Facebook and Twitter is it's either I either win or I learn. Right. My upgrade would be I win and I learn or lose and I learn. Like regardless of the right. outcome, you can learn. Yep. So just because you win doesn't mean you can't learn. And so that's what we mean by learning like a scientist. Regardless of what happens, I feel the outcome because I'm taking it seriously, but then I focus on the process. Why did I fall? Yep. Why did I make it to the top? What can we double down on? What do we need to fix next time? Because all of those lessons are always going to be there. Sometimes we miss them if the only thing we care about is the outcome. I made it to the top, but maybe I was messing up in my process, but don't think about that because I made it to the top. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think as a coach and I see this happen with a lot of coaches and I've definitely been guilty of it quite a bit and I try to catch myself um, as coaches we we tend to believe it's our job to just fix the problems mm -hmm. so I see a lot of coaches say oh that was a good try why don't you try this next time yeah and and for me and you and you tell me your thoughts on this mm -hmm. For me and and for my coaches, we like to ask questions instead. And instead of saying, here, try this, where the hope seems to be, I'm going to tweak something in what you just did. Yeah. You're going to look successful. And in turn, that's going to make me feel successful. Instead, we say, what do you think we can do the next time to make it better? So good. Questions are the best type of feedback. The USA staff, they're experts at that. And so John Kessel, he's one of my mentors. He's part of USA Volleyball. His rule is show them where to look, but not what to see. Mm. And it sounds like, like that. that's exactly what you guys do. Yeah. Because you know the answers. Like right. you know what happened. But if you can guide them to that solution rather than giving it to them, the research, the science behind that shows that lesson will stick with them. If they're working through the problem and they're thinking about the solutions and you've guided them to that, they're going to learn and remember that so much better than if you just give them the answer. Yeah. Which is a lot of the time what we do as coaches. Because, totally. And that's kind of coming from our ego as well, where they messed up. Right. We want them to look good. And right. so we're like, oh, do this. And we've robbed them of a learning experience. Yeah. And, it, you know, as we're still humans, you know, right. we're, we're coaches, we're still humans. Mm -hmm. And it goes right back to that taking it seriously versus taking it personally. When, yeah. when one of our athletes doesn't succeed, right. we take that personal. Right. It's a reflection of us. Oh, my goodness. We need to fix this. Right. Um, and you, again, USA Volleyball is great at this. So what happens in their gym, like if they're practicing serving or hitting and someone like totally shanks a serve, it's like they acknowledge that outcome. But then the feedback usually sounds like, how'd you do that? Versus right. why did you do that? Oh my goodness, you can't do that or, or whatever, or making fun of them or punishing. It's how'd you do that? And then that question kind of leads them to lots of learning opportunities. Oh, right. like uh, my arm swing was too slow. My hips weren't through, whatever it may be. And so feedback through question, like that always takes our focus to the process. Yeah. So that's kind of how they approach it. Man, so, so important. And, you know, since we're on USA Volleyball, there, 
you talked about their culture that mm. they have there in their practices, which you said are open, by the way. So if you're yeah. in Anaheim, you can go watch these practices, which, you know, I since you've said that, I've been thinking, how can I get to Anaheim? Right. You know, I want to get there and just watch mm. Karch coach this team. Yeah. But you said there's there are some principles of how to create this culture of learning. Mm-hmm. And Karch Karai does one of them so well Mm. uh, and that's that to model it and i think that's important not only for coaches but for partners as well and climbing is a very partnership based sport you know if we're climbing a route we have a partner if we're bouldering we have spotters and partners who are giving us feedback constantly so talk to me a little bit about modeling it got it so the most common thing I see in teaching this is people, when they're exposed to it, get ha- excited. They're like, wow, this is so great. But most people think about it of this is so great. I already do this. I need to make someone else do this. Right. So I go back to my team and tell them, hey, you guys need to have a growth mindset. I go back to my partner and say, you need to to be a learner and, and do this. Right. I think the best way to teach somebody this is to model it. So mm-hmm. rather than telling my people like, you guys need to think like this, it's present it to them for sure. Talk to them about it and then walk the walk yourself. Yeah. And so in conversations I've had with the USA Volleyball staff, I explicitly asked them like, how do you create such an incredible culture? And every single one of them, the first thing they say is you have to walk the walk. You have to model it. Like totally. you can't tell your people that you want them to be great learners and you don't do that yourself. And so they talk a lot about owning your mistakes. They try new practice plans and sometimes those practices totally flop and they own it. At the end of practice, they go, wow, we tried some new stuff there and we realized that like in many ways that was a failure. And then they ask the players for feedback. Right. What do you think could have been better there? Where did we miss? What didn't make sense this practice? And then they listen to that feedback and use it. And in doing that, they're modeling this to their players of like, Mm -hmm. look, we don't expect you to be perfect all the time. We want you to experiment. We want you to try new stuff. You can apply that to the classroom. You can apply that to anywhere where if I'm going to be a better teacher, I have to get out of my comfort zone sometimes and try new lesson plans. And sometimes that flops. And then I need to have that level of vulnerability to ask my students like, wow, like what could have been better there? And listen, that's being a scientist. That's yeah. looking for information and feedback and having the guts to experiment and try new things. Yep. And, and so I think I, that's hugely, hugely important. One of my one of my main climbing partners here in Lander is name his name's BJ Tilden. Mm-hmm. And he's by quite a long stretch the the strongest climber around here. He's one of the best climbers in the US, period. And something he does that blows me away every single time that we go climbing is if he's working on something really hard that's way over my head, Mm -hmm. something I have no hope of doing, he'll say, you know, what what are you seeing happen there? Are you, you know, did you see what it was that caused me to fall? Mm -hmm. Do you see better beta that I might be able to use you know he's got all these questions for me Mm. and and this is this is at a level of of climbing that that I'm not at that I will likely never reach yeah um but he thinks that I have something to offer because he's being a scientist right and finding opportunities in every situation Karch Karai does the same thing. Karch Karai is literally the best volleyball player to ever live. Right. I was, I was, when you, <laughs> when you said Karch Karai in your presentation, I was like, whoa, really? Because I used to, I mean, I was a huge Karch Karai and Sinjin Smith right. fan when I was a kid. And I remember a volleyball video game that I always wanted to be Karch Karai, <laughs> yeah. you know? So it blew yeah. me away when right. you brought up Karch Karai. And so he's like the Jordan of the volleyball world. Right. And I always tell people the, the first practice I ever watched, I sat there for three hours. I knew nothing about volleyball. At the end of the practice, he came over, same, same example you just gave. And he goes, what did you see out there? What could we be doing better? That's being a scientist. That's using that 
conversation as an opportunity to grow and get better. He's hungry to find ways to improve his process and he's open to anything that will help him do that. Open to the struggle, open to the challenges, open to feedback and criticism because he knows that improves my process. Yeah. He ends every one-on-one meeting uh, with his players with a question, how can I be better for you? He's searching for information and he's yeah. open to hearing it and, and wow. knows that that can help him get better. And how's that working out for USA Volleyball? I think it's really working. Like, so you can look at the outcomes and results over the past three years. Right. They've done things that have never been done. Uh, in the history of women's volleyball, they won their first ever world championship. Never been done before. Uh, they w- were ranked number one in the world for longer than any other team in USA Volleyball history f- on the women's side. Uh, they were favorites to win gold um, at Rio, fell short. And they're also probably favorites to win gold in Japan in 2020. Yeah. And so I think it's too easy and actually unfair to be like, oh, doing this led to all those because there's a lot that goes into achieving success. There's luck. But I will tell you this from an outside standpoint and observing lots of practices, I have never seen a better learning environment than theirs. And to me, that's even more important than the world championships and all of that. And I know for a fact that that environment has been built by them understanding the learning process, changing the way they communicate, and creating a safe, play, a safe place for people to learn. They've explicitly built that. And I can see that and feel that when I watch them practice. And yeah. to me, that's, that is more impressive than medals and all of this. And of yeah. course, those things have happened. And maybe that culture has led to those. I would say most likely it has. Yeah, and yeah. you told a story in your presentation that I think really sort of wraps all this up really powerfully in that the, the feedback is so important, that the culture is so important, and that modeling it, that Karch Karai did such an amazing job of modeling it. Mm-hmm. And I believe it was at Rio. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, go I ahead and you. You so, know, tell me that story uh, again. Courtney Thompson has been an important player on USA Volleyball for a while now. She's a stud. And I've learned so much from her. And she's just an incredible person to look at and and think about about how she applies all this. Um, In February, I invited a few people out to my apartment to just kind of learn from them and share some information about this. And so Karch was there, so was Courtney. And she was telling a story about how... um, this round at the Olympics, they brought her on the team and she was sort of just a backup. And so she would get in every once in a while just to serve where maybe last round she was the starting setter. And so this, this time she was there um, mostly as a leader and a personality and, and to serve every right. once in a while. They were head and shoulders the favorites to win gold. And this would be the first gold medal they've ever won in 65 plus years. And so she told this story about how uh, they were in like the final four match and it was the fifth set, super high pressure situation and they subbed her in to serve. Um, most of the players on that team uh, do what's called a jump float, which is a kind of high risk, high reward serve. Yeah. Uh, she gets in, serves it out and to s- hear her tell this story you, in my living room, you see like that failure hurt bad. Right, and right. And and I think the way she put it is like, honestly, that was like the lowest point of my volleyball career. Right. And man, they went on to lose that match and fall short of the gold medal. So like a lot was riding on that. But the coolest thing ever was hearing her explain what happened next. So she misses arguably the biggest serve of her life. She comes out of the game and Karch puts his arm around her and he goes, I love how you let it rip. You did exactly what you we wanted you to do. Thank right. you. Yeah. That's walking the walk. Yeah, that's and, mind-boggling. Right. And so if you think about it, man, it's so easy to say like, oh, we're we're about learning and growing and all this stuff where we believe in growth mindset. And it's easy to do that when everything's going smoothly. The real test is what happens when the wheels start to fall off. Right. And I think that is a great example. 
It's just another example of Karch modeling it. And if you think about it, and I saw this in her face, by doing that, Karch turned what could have been one of the lowest points of her career to one of the most positive memories. Like that was so important for her. And he's living in reality. He wasn't like, oh, great job or whatever. Right, he's just right. like, you did what we expect you to do. When you jump float, sometimes you serve it out. And yep. there's nothing like your technique was solid. Everything was solid. You you went and let it rip. And yeah, she had I the confidence it. to really go for it. Right in a pressure situation and that's, that's the culture that they've created where he calls it we've created a safe place for people to learn and if you think about most groups most cultures either success is too precious so we're not going to let it rip we're not going to experiment and try new things we're not going to take on challenges because we're so afraid to fail right and as adults mistakes are like Oh, you right. shouldn't be making mistakes. Right. So it, it's you know? two, the, the two characteristics of a culture where maybe it, it would be hard to learn. If success is too precious or mistakes are so like frowned upon. Yeah. And both of those things will lead to people playing it safe. Um, and when people are playing it safe and obsessed over those outcomes, the research shows that performance will tend to dip and so will our capacity to learn and grow and take on challenges. And so, yeah. man, I can't say enough about not only Karch, but like the players on that team right. and the assistant coaches and the managers, like everyone there has adopted this where we are here, we are in the lab, we are scientists, we want to become great learners. And when you create that culture, it really snowballs. Like everyone's there to get better. They're more receptive to feedback. They're asking for feedback. Yeah. They're seeing situations as opportunities, not as threats. And it's just so cool to see that. Yeah. And that's something it's take. It, it took time to build, but they've done it and it's amazing. Yeah, they've created this safe place to learn, which is a safe place to make mistakes and a safe place to struggle and a safe place to look bad. And they still take the outcome super seriously. Yeah, like, yeah they you, want it. If you watch their interviews, they straight up say, we well, want to be the first USA volleyball team on the women's side to win a gold medal. Right. They own it. Mm -hmm. They have that goal. They pursue that goal. And their approach to pursuing that goal is to create this environment. Yeah. So they so own the outcome. They have those goals. And then they create a place where our people can learn and develop as much as possible because they know that's how you achieve the goal. Man, so, so powerful, so strong. I don't want to take up too much of your time <laughs> here. We've been talking for an hour and 10 minutes already. <laughs> um, I do, however, feel like First off, I'm glad you're in Denver because I'm definitely just going to come to Denver and track you down again. I feel time, like there's man. so much more we could talk oh, about. Yeah. Um, you know, before we wrap this up, I know that you do a lot of reading and research and talking to people on this subject. And, and I've been dipping into this subject more and more. Are there... Is there a list of books that yeah. you have that people can go out and download or pick up and read or whatever? Yes. And so there's a few like maybe like the top few that have really resonated with me. Obviously, Mindset is a great book. Carol Dweck's book is great. And I think it does a good job of showing how powerful the mindsets can become. Yeah. But as far as really like adapting this and applying this, I think there are books that maybe even do a better job. Okay. They don't explicitly call it growth mindset, but it's kind of what we're talking right, about. Right. This focus, this ego and all this. I think The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday really hit home with me. And that's a great summary of stoicism and about how you can apply that in everyday life. Once you read that, I became hungry to figure out more about stoicism and then I started reading Seneca. That was, an, I think, a good, like, this is what it means in real life example. Right. Um, those two books were great. All of Brene Brown's work is huge. And so she has a book called Daring Greatly, which is talks a lot about vulnerability and taking on challenges and getting out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And then her newest book, Rising Strong, is probably one of the most powerful things I've read ever and that's about okay we can talk about getting out of your comfort zone and and jumping into challenges but what happens when you get your butt kicked how do you deal with adversity and failure and what does that look like right and 
she in that book summarizes her research in that and it's pretty incredible so rising strong great book perhaps the best like case study of what i believe to be a great mindset is the book love warrior and she glennon doyle melton shares her like life experiences and stories uh i tell people usually it takes me a month to read a book it took me like two days to read love warrior um great example of being vulnerable and looking at and finding opportunities in every situation so Mm. love warrior rising strong daring greatly the obstacle is the way all incredible books yeah this is great because i haven't read any of these right so now i'm now i'm excited a sneaky one that talks a lot about fear which we didn't touch on today but it's a big part of the learning puzzle it's called the war of art by stephen pressfield and he talks it's kind of about like the process of writing but you can apply this to like everything and he talks about that he calls it the resistance of like why we're afraid to do things out of our comfort zone and what to do about that it's a short book but like that might be one of the best like kick in the butt books of like whoa cool this is why i do a lot of the things i do so i'll add that to the list too the war of art awesome i've got some new reading to do (laughs) and and so do all of you guys out there and also you know i i spent a lot of time yesterday in recovering from the fourth um (laughs) or from the first half of the fourth i guess (laughs) looking through train ugly and reading the articles and watching the videos Mm. and there's so much good free content there that you know i definitely recommend that everybody listening go to trainugly.com spend some time on there bookmark it go back and spend more time on Mm. there you know this you've got so much content on there that it's it's impossible to digest it all in one sitting you know you're just not going to do it but i think it's a you've got great summaries and great reminders on there that people can go and remember how to find that growth mindset Mm -hmm. how to apply the principles of learning Mm -hmm. there's so much in there so you guys should all definitely go and man let's let's definitely do this again sometime anytime is there you know where can where can people reach out to you if they want to or Uh, on the website i have my phone number and email so awesome i always tell people like selfishly i love when people reach out with questions or thoughts or ideas because conversations like this like just now i'm taking notes like things that you've said have given me ideas about better ways to explain this and better ways to apply it so right. as many conversations that i can have about this the better i get so selfishly yeah. like please reach out yeah uh, with questions or which is exactly why i do this podcast right you know i i wanted to reach out to you because i'm like man I, there's a ton i can learn from this guy right If I can sit down and have an hour conversation, that's a big hour win for me. Totally. Um, And like, same goes for me. That's why I said yes, because uh, like every time you do this, every time you work through it and try to explain it, you get better. Um, Again, that's being the scientist. And so, man, anytime. Cool. So reach out to Trevor, all of you guys. (laughs) So much information that he can give. So thank you a ton. I really appreciate you sitting down with me and let's do this thing again it's an honor man anytime cool thanks Thanks. you know as i mentioned before trevor and i sat down and talked in july this past july and i've been digging more and more into mindset and into the feedback uh, that goes along with it and and i just think it's become more and more important to me um i mean no matter how much training you do it really doesn't mean anything if you can't apply it in a healthy way and especially for coaches parents partners significant others whatever it might be you know the the feedback that we give to to our partners to our students it needs to be constructive and and we can we can think that we're doing something really positive and and it can still be uh, damaging in in some way so I think it's just really important to take these things into account and it's definitely changed my vocabulary as a coach and and everyone that I've talked to about this I've I've done a few workshops on it now 
um, and just worked with coaches uh, on on the growth mindset and on the feedback that they give and and I've gotten really positive responses so so I'm excited about the future of this and to dig into it more and and I'll be looking into Trevor's book list which I think you should as well and I've put his book list up on our site uh, with links uh, to Amazon to buy the books and if you guys click through there and buy those books through our site it doesn't raise your price any but we get a little bit of a kickback from amazon which helps support the podcast and we appreciate any support Um, you can also support by becoming a patron and this week the patrons get uh, an extra episode from trevor they get access to the we scream like eagles podcast in which Trevor and I discuss the three questions that you can ask yourself to go from focusing on outcomes to focusing on opportunities. And I think that's a really important part of the process. So um, if you're interested in that, for as little as a dollar a month, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash powercompanypodcast, and we would love to have you over there. Uh, you can find Trevor at trainugly.com. Reach out to him, please. And you can follow him on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. Uh, you can find us at powercompanyclimbing.com and at powercompanyclimbing on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Uh, you will not, however, find us on the Twitters because, like uh, mental master Hazel Finley once said, We don't tweet, we scream like eagles. <laughs> Perfect. This time, 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 power, power, this time, the bill. Yeah.